Scott, how are you, Royal? Yeah, as well as can be expected, is what I always say. But uh, yeah, no, I'm good. Very good. Hey, looking well. Uh, trying to keep fit. It gets harder when you get to the grand old age of uh, 78, which I am. Okay, 52, but that's old enough. Yeah, it's, it's an uphill struggle, isn't it, when you're uh, a bit older? It's different now, though, for us, isn't it? Because I'm, I'm, um, I'm not as old as you, obviously. <laughs> um, by that, I mean I'm 51. <laughs> but, um, like, when I was a kid, Scott, there's no way a 51 year old will be down the gym, smashing it, you know, going out, cracking ultra marathons, doing triathlon, wearing hoodies and, and running tops and baseball caps. When, when I was a kid, by the time you got to about 25, you were old, like really old. You dressed in tweed, you had a hat. <laughs> Um, you didn't swear and stuff like <laughs> times have changed haven't they well we were or it, people were older because if you think you joined the corps for instance at 16 or 18 or 20 whatever people did but you really only stayed till you were 40 that was it so when I was a young bootneck 16 or 18 years old if you look at a sergeant major when I asked them you thought they are super old you know, it's like my dad, older than my dad, you know. And so you look at, I had this line in the sand forever, that 40-year-olds, you know. Argh. And then when I reached 40 and started going plus, I was like, Ugh. <laughs> still alive. And so I think you do draw a line in the sand at 40, being in the military, you know. And it's changed a bit now, I know, is it? Because they, they tend to go on a little bit further. It's mad that people I joined up with are still, they're just leaving now, but they've been serving up until now. So for almost 35 years, yeah. um, many of them reached the, the um, you know, rank of major and this, this sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, Gaz, who I was, did the nine miler with at the weekend uh, or the previous weekend, he, he's a colonel now. It's, just um apps i find it absolutely absolutely fascinating personally i wouldn't swap the adventure i've been on across well the whole world um and all the learning involved sort of for for any position in any company but have you found that your, yourself because you must have traveled quite a bit now and yeah and, i mean you know i've Sorry, I should add, being a police officer, you see a side of life, I guess, that a lot of people don't. Well, it's funny, actually. Uh, I thought I was, uh, uh, the time I left the Marines anyway, I thought I was quite tough. Um, and actually, then I joined the police and I realised uh, that that would toughen you up. You know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday night um, in a big town or city centre, you know, going from fight to fight to fight, you soon have a different perspective on life, I tell you. You know, different from the core, not better or worse, just certainly different but I've had like these three sort of main careers really so I had the first element 12 years that's a lie actually I always exaggerate Chris it was 11 years 11 months and nine days or something so we'll say 12 years 12 years in the core about 18 years in the police but I made a transition started making the transition into sort of um, outdoor adventure and tv stuff maybe 10 years into that and then at the last eight years solid, uh, solidly being in tv uh, doing uh, well not just tv events uh, guiding mountaineering all that sort of stuff you know but the tv is, is paying the, the mortgage you know mm. so, so what you would join the core around the same time i i would have i'm assuming uh 86 oh okay but, 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 but july 86 yeah i was 88 88 when uh, training got really, really tough. <laughs> um, you, you wouldn't know about that, mate. Well, as you know, it was always, always tougher when we did it uh, <laughs> just a few years before you. But uh, <laughs> hey, I'm glad it wasn't any tougher. So I, I, I sometimes do a few talks and I say, you know, I was one of the youngest Marines, but there were so many young lads. I was, I don't know how I did actually, because was, I was 16 years and three and a half months. I don't know what the rules were because my birthday is in March, and so uh, April, May, June, yeah, July. So for nearly four months, so sixteen and four months. So I'm sure there's people who, who were younger than that, but they, there couldn't have been too many younger than that. I don't think. Mm. What about you? How old are you? I was 18 when I joined. I think 
17 when I went to the recruiting office. Practically a man. Almost yeah. a grown-up. Yes. Like, you know, be, being a 16-year-old, it was a lot easier because we didn't have to run quite as far. And uh, we used to get specialist treatment. You know, we used to get a pint of, uh, half a pint of milk a day, you know, which gave us the edge on everyone else, really, as a junior. You got your half a pint of milk. I don't know if you did it when you were in, but we got our, our milk every day. So that, that gave us the edge. That, that, you know, that was preferential treatment. <laughs> Are you being serious now or, or taking a mic? It, it, I thought the standards were the same across the board. Yeah, they're absolutely the same. Yeah. But that, with the only difference being that um, what we had, I think there's about 11 or 12 juniors in the troop who were under 17 or under 18. So we, we got half a pint of milk and we had to go every did morning. You, when you did the commando test, did you get longer time? <laughs> no. No, okay. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. uh, you didn't have to carry the 84. You're only 16. It's a bit heavy for you. <laughs> Okay, so no, the point no. we're getting to is it? <laughs> there's no, um, you know, there's no get out of jail free car for anybody. You, you, you either do it or you, you, you don't. Yeah. And our officers have to do it all a quicker, obviously. Yeah, they they do do it a bit quicker. Some of the, the tests were all the tests, but um, I joined at uh, sixteen. I think a few years before that, and someone will probably comment they used to have junior troops. And the whole troop, I think, was made up of, of kids, you know, under 17. I can't come on on that, but mine was mixed. So we had, I don't know how many it was then, maybe 52 people. And I think it was, there was about 10 or 12 of us were, were 16 or, or certainly under 17, yeah. So it's a funny dynamic, you know, when you've been going straight from school and a child, and then suddenly you're, you're thrown in with men and, uh, you know, but it was great. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. Did that affect you then when you got to your unit? Because you would have been too young to go on active service, would you not? <laughs> yeah, I did. So immediately I passed out of training, which was uh, 27th of March um, uh, the following year. So I was, set, I was just 17 by three weeks. And so, of course, we did the beat up. I was at 4-2 Commando uh, M Company. We had the beat up for Spearhead and we were off to Northern Ireland uh, for a sort of quick tour, six or seven weeks. So I did all the beat up. Um, no one said anything to me. It's like, here we go. You know, and then about a week before I was going, the Sergeant Major called me and said, yeah, a bit of an issue. Uh, you're not coming, you know. And there's, I think, three of us in the company. And so, yeah, we're left behind, which was, which was really shit because you would just done all this Royal Marine training. You, you know, you, you go from the top of the ladder, you know, commando training, Greenberry. Then you go back to the bottom again, get to your commando unit and you're a sprog, you know, whatever. And then this is your way, of course, as you know, to fit in, go on a tour, and get established, but uh, yeah, you can't go. So you're on a rear party and the lads will go off. And of course, when they come back, you know, whatever they felt uh, of the tour, you know, they were part of that tour, uh, operational tour. And, and it was quite difficult for a few months to, to fit back in there, you know, and start sort of building bridges again, you know. I think it was in the following year, we went to Norway, usual winter deployment. Yeah, it's fine then, you know, three months and then you're back in. But, uh, yeah, it was. It was uh, I was upset with that. Yeah, at the time. How did you find Norway then, if you were so young? Well, again, again, you know, we used to have tent sheets in those days. We used to carry these seven tent sheets uh, on your back. And uh, it, again, if you're under eighteen, the lads are really kind, and they say you don't have to carry the tent sheets because you're under eighteen, uh, or the Yelpa sledge, um, and actually don't have to ski so far. Uh, yeah, it was, I, I mean, oh God, I was five foot five. And um, 10, 10 stone. No, it wasn't. It was five foot five and eight and a half stone. I wasn't much bigger when I was actually in Norway. And then, uh, you know, three or four years later, when I was training to be a PTI, I was five foot 10 and, you know, 12 stone. So that was the difference between a boy's body and a man's body. So, yeah, you know, I struggled. Um, always passing, always there with the team, but always at the back and, you know, struggling. But, um, yeah, it was, it was good, though. It was good. Yeah. Did you get out to Ireland in the end? Yeah, so I went to, um, I became a, an LC about two years later. I went down to Pool, and actually it was brilliant because, you know, we always say, don't we, join the Corps or whatever and see the world, but probably you don't necessarily see that much of the world. But as an LC, I got a deployment on um, Intrepid. And so actually we went to like, I don't know, the whole, we did a Mediterranean tour, world tour, you know, um, but just before that, uh, or sorry, when I came back from that, I went back to Poole and then I went off to Northern Ireland, which was then called Snowney. 
and um, we did uh, Carlingford Lock um, and Lock Nate. So I did a, in the end a nine month tour actually. I did six months and got, um, got extended, volunteered to stay out there because it was just a great job. So uh, in the end did a sort of back to back tours there, but you know, yeah, it was good, interesting. And what's your role there? Are you trying to stop weapons being transited across the lakes or the locks? The main role is uh, try to tolerate uh, small ships routine with um, 20 matlows. That's the, that's the hardest challenge. Nah, they were good, good lads, actually. Yeah, so I worked predominantly Carlingford Lock, yeah, so we did boardings every day. We did our patrols, um, uh, some land patrols and some on the water, OPs, you know, and, uh, yes, trying to stop not just, I think, weapons, drugs, crewman activity as well as terrorist activity, but we did boardings. They were the bits that were great fun, um, you know, all, all times of the day and night in all weather conditions. We put the lads up on the, on the boat, you know, ships would only slow down to... 10, 12, maybe 15 knots. They're all good fast boardings, nighttime, you know, exciting days, actually. Yeah. Did you ever get out to Hong, Hong Kong? You know, I didn't. I, I was, uh, uh, I went to the IT shed afterwards, which is the uh, the old radar instructor team and all the boys in their old sweats, you know, honky fin. And it was all dits and stories about Hong Kong. And uh, yeah, no, I never went out there, actually, but I would have loved to. It was the one place I would have loved to have gone. Yeah. But uh, yeah, they had they, stories they, for a lifetime anyway. They used to go out in the, is it the South China Sea and they'd have to stop the smugglers coming from the mainland and probably vice versa. Um, yes, quite, quite, that was quite, quite a place and quite a role. What, uh, did you have any sort of fines or anything or do you have any successes or any hairy moments? Um, did we have any hairy moments? I don't know. Sometimes uh, we did a couple of OP, uh, some OP work with some of the SB lads and they were always doing good ops and that was quite exciting. Uh, we come under fire a couple of times, but only random, nothing really. Uh, I was squeezed between a couple of big um, firefights. The tour before me, one of the lads I think got shot, um, one of the LC lads called uh, Fang Parker. Um, it was maybe a year before got shot shot in the in over the backside or the leg I think um, opened up on so it was you know it was, it was amongst it but we didn't really you know have too many contacts really just in support of other people quite quiet and what um, what branch of the police did you join is that is that the right expression uh, well you join the um, you you joined just as a police officer first of all and of course I became a, a PTI and I, I did seven or eight years really finishing my time in the corps as a PTI so when I left the marines to join the police and by the way I, I was sulking um, I went up to Antarctica I spent a year in Antarctica on board HMS Endurance um, brilliant draft the sort of draft that you knew was brilliant when you're on it you didn't have to look back later and go it was shit but now I look back, it was brilliant. On it, I knew that it was like life changing and amazing. I was the only PTI responsible all for the fitness and stuff. And um, I just loved it. Expeditions, if you like mountaineering, brilliant. And then you get a preferential draft at the end of it. I put in for, I think, pool again as a PTI. And uh, the Corps decided that. So I was just due for my seniors, actually, senior command course. So they thought they'd help me out by sending me to 4 5 commando which was geographically the furthest place from my home. And um, so I showed them, <laughs> I showed them and, and left Corps, and joined the police. And uh, so I'm in the Sergeant Major going, okay, see you then. <laughs> you know, what? You surely, you know, you want to fight for me? No. Um, so yeah, I joined the police just as a Bobby. And so uh, I, uh, I left the uh, easy transition when you leave the Corps. Um, fitness wise and all that sort of stuff you know out of one uniform into the next I went to Ashford Police Training College and uh, 15 weeks um, and you know you're polishing shoes and ironing shirts and getting into police training but the biggest step was diversity the biggest step was to you know actually you know you've been in the core and um, perhaps your levels of uh uh what's the word i'm trying to think of really interaction with others aren't as good as they could be and you know you've got to, you, you're going to start um working with lots of other people from lots of other uh, backgrounds and communities and the public of course and you have to sort of get a little bit of the bootneck mentality out of your head straight away which you're not going to last very long for instance you can't just punch people in the face 
uh, that's a no no you have to uh, have some rules and then you can punch people in the face so uh, it was it, it's quite difficult to make that transition and a load of lads bootnecks mat lows um you know army lads uh, they went by the wayside you know they just couldn't make that transition behavior you know and it's only just being careful what you say and, and knowing your audience i think but actually it was great i did um six or seven years frontline policing and who wouldn't want to do that you know fast cars going to fights and really adren adrenalized all the time and new challenges it was great yeah you know it's good i nicked this one guy uh, for murder which is always a or attempted murder you know get the old murder badge and um it was funny he was uh, an ex-gurka and he'd stabbed someone and they said yeah you know go go to this job and uh, he's been stabbed in the back of a cab and i get there and i arrive it's right outside the front of a pub with about 300 people in the garden and open the taxi and there's this guy on the floor blood everywhere lying there and with my colleague and she sort of you know starts giving him first aid and the taxi driver says behind you behind you you know and there he is this guy ready for action and um uh it's funny because if you read some of these statements, they go, oh, the lad, the, the police officer was amazing. Really muscular, massive police officer. Got to be six for eight, you know. And he rolled across the front of the taxi cab and he grabbed this guy by the throat, punched the knife out of his hand, threw him over his shoulder in a judo throw and stood on the back of his head and said, you know, one in custody, murder. You know, it was all very exciting. Um, and that was literally the landlord's statement. But in fact... I'd walked around the front of the car, probably put my hand on the taxi. The guy was crying who committed the crime and he, he didn't have a knife. He had one of those big carving forks, you know, that you do your Sunday roast with. Obviously he still did a bit of damage. And he fell to the floor himself onto his knees and dropped the, the, the knife, the fork. And I just grabbed his wrist and then he fell onto the floor. I mean, he literally put himself onto his front, put his hands behind his back. And that was it. I'll tell you what, Scott, we'll, Let's go for the other story. We'll do a bit of editing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Incredible. Yes, I, I was, um, I listened to Ant Middleton's book a couple of years back and he was saying he, he joined the police for a while. Did he? <laughs> yeah. And it, it was a very short lived career. I don't think he got through training because of what you were saying. And, and it wasn't that, according to his um, account, it wasn't that he'd done anything particularly bad, but he'd said to, uh, I'm guessing it would be a Sikh, at, at breakfast one day in training, he said, you're going to wear that thing every day, right? And, of course, the sad nature of society is, 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 is it was just a genuine question especially if you're going to be a policeman and you're supposed to wear a helmet and this kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I think he was quickly on a, some sort of warning. Well, it, it, it wouldn't take much. I mean, that wouldn't have gotten chucked out, but accumulation of a few, you know, things you do have to get switched on quite. I, I made loads of faux pas and people took me to one side and get, had a quiet word. And uh, it went on for a while actually, because your training is two years. You, you do this probationary period and that's the time when you can, really get it wrong so luckily I, I was super lucky my first sergeant was an ex bootneck guy called jeff brooks he's, he's dead now he's a nice guy um and he just took me shut the office door it's funny you know he, he didn't exactly grab me by the throat but he was sort of a nose to nose of you know you know this is a, this is not the call this is the police keep your nose clean you know stop being a twat um you know you're a police officer now and i'm going to be on top of you like a you know whatever a giant hammer if you uh, start stepping out of line but it was great because every time i i did go over the top you know what's like not just bootneck mentality but pti as well so guess what i'm a bit over the top i'm full of confidence you know and um extrovert you know so i'm cracking jokes and funnies all the time which funny old thing chris some people didn't find funny <laughs> so you you adapt and then i you know i came as i became a sergeant and then you suddenly got to really adapt because you're supervising you know 20 people hey scott i've got a brilliant joke for you right how do you drown a pti no it's impossible i think Too put, strong. A, put a mirror on the bottom of the pool <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what you, I tell you this, I remember a time, this is true, I couldn't walk past a mirror without looking in it. Now, 
I dared look in it. I stuck <laughs> underneath the mirror that I see. Uh, so, we've all been there. We were all are there now. Yes. So I'm actually uh, more fascinated to hear about your, your travels and your adventures and how you, 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 I mean, you've got Patagonia on your hat and I, I'm going to guess a lot of people probably don't even know where that is. No disrespect if you do know where it is, um, but southern part of Argentina, very rugged wasteland, but, but ideal for um, adventure programs. And I think there's sort of, well, you, it ends in Tierra de, del Fuego, which is where you have to go if you want to expedition to Antarctica or at least that's one of the routes. Um, Ushuaia down there on the on the very southern tip. It's a little bit sort of like the Falklands when you're down there. And it's similar as if you got to the very north point of Scotland. So John O'Groats, it's that really beautiful, unique, but almost barren and desolate sort of feeling. Um, so I just went on a bit of a tangent there, but you can see I love traveling and, and or I'm pleased that I've done a fair bit of it. What at what point did you get in, start to get involved in the television stuff? Well, just on the travel quickly, of course, I, I did a bit in the core and then my year in Antarctica, you go down all, all the coasts of South America. You know, we went to Buenos Aires and uh, Montevideo and down to Uruguay. And we went on a little expedition in Uruguay, of course, over to South Georgia, had six weeks in South Georgia, then Antarctica and then back up the other side. So did a lot of travel there. But what I found is uh, in the police, I, I went from police officer, to police sergeant, and then I was a police trainer. So I started doing, um, you know, some farms and, and uh, taser and um, uh, self-defense, you know, officer safety training and PSU and all this sort of stuff. And with all those skills from police officer and train and the training elements, particularly, because I tell you this, the big thing that comes into TV is risk and risk assessment. I'll come back to that. So um, what the police did is they made me go on a national risk assessment course. In fact, a health and safety call called NEBOSH. And people may not have heard of it. You might have heard of all sorts of health and safety qualifications. IOSH and NEBOSH is the front runner. NEBOSH, um, you know, throughout the UK, that is your expertise in sort of um, uh, health and safety. And that was like six months of my life. I'll never get back. Um, they sent me to university one day a week to do this NEBOSH. And once you pass your NEBOSH exam, you don't have to start talking like this and being unreasonable about taking any sort of risks. So that was, that was a really good uh, certificate. But basically, everything I'd done in the core, particularly as a PTI, and then the police sort of gave me all these tools, um, which are going to be very useful in not so much TV, but the, the TV and the outdoors. And so, um, you know, you, you're already there. You can you can work with helicopters, you can work with boats, you can do risk assessments, your first aid and, and medic stuff, which in the police is really high as well. Um, and then just all your experience to travel. And of course, as a PTI, I was already... Uh, um, a, a, not a mountain guide but a mountain leader you know and we used to have to do what's called a jesma and a uel and spa and all these qualifications for climbing and abseiling and mountaineering so you've got it all if you're going to work in extreme environments and the first place i went to to work with bear anyway um my first real outdoor show was in sumatra mm. um and uh, i was still in the police and, I, and uh, basically i needed 33 days off so I took a bit of annual leave and I said to my boss, can I have some unpaid leave? You know, it's just a one trip in a sort of lifetime. And he said, yeah, yeah, take it. So I went to Sumatra for 33 days down in Indonesia, beautiful, rugged, amazing part of the world. Yes. It's, funnily enough, one of the few parts of the world I haven't really experienced, obviously been in Thailand and Southeast Asia, but, Yes, looks uh, uh, quite exotic is the feeling I get when I think about that part of the world. I well, know it, it is great. And uh, but once you get down there, you know, very few roads, all jungle tracks, you know, you've got extreme jungle conditions there. Um, but, but it's amazing. And we did one show in the jungle and one show on the coast. Um, but great. And at the same time as doing the TV, I then started to um, start working with uh, or my own company, which at the time was called Yomp Training Consultancy. 
and um, I started doing guiding. So yeah, little trips in North Wales, and then that's quickly spread over to the Alps, and then that quickly spread to places like Nepal, of course. And so I was working every time I could get any time off at all in TV, and if I had any more available time, then I was doing my own company stuff and gradually easing down the police. So after I'd used up all my leave and the police weren't happy anymore for unpaid leave, I started taking a day off a week. So I was part time and then two days, then three days until I got to the very bare minimum, which is 16 hours. Um, oh, a bit like, bit like being a PTI then. <laughs> exactly the same, but slightly smaller biceps. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that went on. And then, of course, I had to make the, the leap um, and head out. But, you know, the last eight years particularly have opened up for me because I've had more time available now working in the industry full time. And there's no there's no doubt about it. You know, people say to me, oh, you've got the best job in the world. And I have, Chris, I have, because uh, what I tend to do, it's not just me. There's a team of two or three of us. We usually divide up, but... Um, there'll be a series and uh, we'll have to film two shows usually at a location. And a good example is uh, next week I'm off uh, for two or three weeks to Mammoth, Mammoth Mountains in uh, the States. And, um, you know, I'll have two weeks with a fixer who sort of knows the area quite well. And I'll go to 25 locations high in the mountains, in the gorges and the lakes. And I'll try and find some um, amazing um sort of journeys you know i'm looking for a waterfall and then quite close to it is a little cave system and maybe just in the next valley is a lake and then the next valley you know is a, a really rugged mountain rock face and then i sort of bring it all together you know i'm trying to get some ideas so i've got this this a to b to c to d journey um, and then we put other bits in there as well and then so that's week one or two and then um i'll come home a couple of weeks later go back out again and this time I'll just take a buddy, one of my boys, and um, we'll test everything. So we'll we'll climb the rock face, we'll abseil down the waterfall, you know, we'll paraglide from the top of that mountain um, and test those bits and pieces just to make sure that, you know, our crew can get up there and do it because they do, they have to be on the same terrain, you know, and of course the cast, the stars and uh, uh, the presenters can do it as well and, um, and make sure it's safe. So we're putting all those protocols in. Then phase three is the filming. We get out there, then it runs at a million miles an hour, and then our job role changes from recce and scout to um, looking after the crew as they bounce around and try and cross the same terrain um, as the presenters. So I'm going to dive in there with a question. Have you had crew that you just wanted to throttle because they were so useless? Um, sorry, no. I got, I've gone straight in with a negative there, folks. No, no, but... no it's good. I've, I've had to execute several crew members and we've left them buried under dry riverbeds no um you know first of all these tv crews a lot of them um if you you know you might be brilliant at your job at, at uh, sound or audio or light or whatever it is um or or cameraman but actually on the train we are in sometimes the train is very very difficult and sometimes they're extreme environments you know sometimes we are in the middle of, of nowhere it's taking two or three days to get there and helicopter bumps and um, you are in extreme locations. Other times they look extreme, but actually they're not so bad. Um, but uh, the crew that we work with a lot, um, usually are pretty good on their feet and they know what they're doing. In fact, the crew that I work with 99% of the time, these guys are bloody good. Mm. You know, they bounce from rock to rock. In fact, sometimes they, they move a bit fast and a bit risk of, um, take a few too many risks in order to, you Keep know, talking. yeah, to get that shot. And so sometimes it's just a matter of putting them on a rope and calming them down a bit. But they're highly talented, not just in the, the job role that they do, but the movement on the terrain as well. But now and again, you get a new member in. And actually, before Christmas, I was in Moab and uh, we had an almost entirely new team, really. And it's a big, big difference. But then you just adjust the way that you, you deal with people on the ground, slow it down, give lots more safety briefs, clip on a safety rope a bit more often than you would with the other guys. And... Um, and get them to you know learn as they go along. We had a cameraman actually never been in a helicopter, and we just had to do some GV. So he's going to fly up and down and do some beauty shots, you know, uh, with the camera. So he sat with his legs down there over the side, and I've clipped him on. And so he can't go anywhere, you know. He's he's got you know he's, he's strapped in if you like, but his feet are hanging over the side doors off. And of course, I'm just sitting next to him, 
um, on my phone, just reading my emails. <laughs> you know? And I notice as we start to bank the helicopter, he's leaning out the aircraft, his bums off the ground because he's going with the helicopter. He's getting sort of fixated on the ground and, you know, he can't really go anywhere. He had about three inches of movement, but it was just funny to see. And he put the camera down like, and he was like, oh, wow, that was really weird. So just by putting a hand on his shoulder, gave him a bit more confidence and he was fine. But, you know, you only need one or two rides in the helicopter, then it becomes normal, you know, and we get shipped around so much. It's just a, it's just a bus. It's just a taxi, isn't it? I think we used to call them cabs, didn't we, in the, in the court? It's an incredibly expensive one, though. <laughs> it is. And on those shows, they, they buy them out for the whole day, you know, three or four days. And at three, three and a half uh, thousand an hour, whatever it's dollars, you know, it's a, a lot of cost. But the pilots love being called taxi drivers. They, they're really keen on that. Mm. But I now, bet you have to resist the urge to say, look, I'm, I'm taking this baby up. <laughs> Well, the, the main guy we use in the UK, Will, Will Banks from GB Helicopters, he's a legend. He's an ex-Matlow um, pilot, um, famous for landing his links on a um, warship and the links decided to slip over the side into the, into the ocean. That was him. Um, but I tell you this, he is a phenomenal pilot. You know, of course he is. All that military background. He, and he puts this all over the place. You know, he, we definitely go places that other helicopters wouldn't even consider. But, you know, he's, he is amazing. Very good. It's funny to think when they chucked all those Hueys into the, was it the bloody Indian Ocean or the South Pacific after Vietnam, Literally, they were just pushing them off the aircraft carriers, weren't they? To get, to get, to, it's just a massive surplus of helicopters. But they were so basic, they probably were worth, you know, five thousand pounds or some, something. But you lose a Lynx, that's a few million quids worth going over the side. I'm yeah. guessing. Yeah, and let's not forget about the two, uh, the pilot and the navigator. They're they're probably quite a good commodity. Yes. <laughs> Yes. And um, when you're flying, you, 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 you're obviously flying a lot. Are, are you in the castle class or do they put you up, put you up front? Uh, yeah, a bit of a bone of contention. And uh, so I'll air it on this on this uh, media now. Um, yeah, no, I go cattle class all the time, which uh, annoys me because, you know, the, some of the directors and producers and other people, they don't, fine, and they maybe earn the right to be up front, you know, earn a bit more money and all that sort of stuff. But it makes me laugh. They then get to location and they, in their contracts, they've usually got a day off to recover from, you know, jet lag. And old wanker chops here, that, you know, seven o'clock in the morning, straight in the car, starting the recce process. And actually an hour later, I could be tying knots and rigging abseils and tyrolean, you know. And so it's one of my bugbears but yeah unfortunately i'm in the back in cattle class mm. uh, which hasn't been too bad recently because there's no one in the back so just before christmas to moab i just stretched out across five chairs you know because there was like 11 people flying to the states but i'm sure we'd be back to normal now so mm. yeah it's a bit annoying but of course it's super ex extravagant isn't it business class compared to being in the back end yeah well if you're flying the whole crew crew out at business class or first class or whatever they call it that that's that's an awful lot of money isn't it that's going to put yeah. the production costs through the roof i saw i sort of get it but anyway that's my little bugbear but you know they're the bosses nothing's ever going to change you know and, and that's the way it is and that's how life is but um yeah you know we get treated well don't get me wrong um we get all our expenses of course all our fuel and taxis and accommodation and and we get what's called a per diem um uh, a little daily sort of rate uh, as well as all your foods like 25 dollars get coffees and stuff and you know so you don't have to keep going into your wallet so you know what we get treated well we get treated well mm. scott i've i've heard a few things right and i i have to ask you is bear grills actually a bear <laughs> that that's exactly the first question that I thought you was going to ask actually because I'd already prepped for it. You know so, what? is he a grizzly or a brown bear or <laughs> polar bear perhaps? Do you know what? I will say this. You know, um, you know, he's a TV presenter. 
that's what he will say first and foremost you know that's what he what, that's what he does he's bloody good at it um and uh you know he's got his journey and uh what he's done over the last 20 or 30 years but and it's controversial anyone on tv i mean tv is cheated you know tv to get the pictures that you see has to be to a degree cheated you know it's not like we could go away like we did years and years ago and have 30 days filming for two shows now we have to do the same thing in four days you know um and so we can't go to a mega extreme environment for instance miles away from anywhere it costs too much money and we can't be filming, filming the shit out of everything and the whole of tv is the same i worked with gordon ramsay mm -hmm. last week on the show and of course it is you know if it doesn't happen on tv in front of the camera then it doesn't happen um and so people love him or loathe him, you know, as, as, as well. They do Middleton in a different way. Um, what I would say about Bear is that uh, he's, he's bloody talented. He's good on the ground, you know, his movement and his fitness. And, um, you know, he is one of the good guys. He's a, tr he's a truly nice guy. He's always trying to do the right thing. And if you just, you know, he's an honorary colonel in the Marines. I know he gets maybe a bit of grief for that, but actually... You know, he's doing it for the right reasons. He's doing it because his dad was uh, in the Corps and he wants to try and help the Corps with its recruitment, you know, and he's, he's doing his bit. Uh, same with the Scouts, you know, and he really is committed to those charities, the Scouts, the Corps, and I think Tusk is the other one he does at the moment with the Rhino. He puts a lot of time and effort into it. So, you know, he's one of the good guys and, um, you know, yeah, I like him. I like him a lot. Mm. And uh, he's incredibly successful and good at what he does. What can I say? What's his real name then? Because I know Bears, I, I've heard him explain the nickname. Uh, is, is, real it Regi name? is it Reginald? Barry. Barry. <laughs> no, his real name is um, Edward. Edward Michael. Oh, of course it is. Edward Girls, yeah. yeah. But it's funny because when I go, when I go to the, I do some talks sometimes, you know, what people like when they're introducing you, they're not really that interested. And they go, now we're going to our next guest speaker. He works for Barry Grillis. Uh, his name is Stephen Hetherford. That's me, you know, and, and I get they always get it wrong. Bear's name um, and my name as well, which is which is funny. But, yeah, no, um, I, I know the story as well. But, um, yeah, he's a good lad. He's a good lad. I read an interesting story years ago. You might you might even have heard it yourself, but it was Matt Dickinson. And he set off to film one of Brian Blessed's. I think many attempts on Everest and mm. it, it was back when I think Brian tried to do it in all the traditional gear that Ma Mallory and um, you know, that, that kind of era would have, would have worn. It, yeah. And when Brian got to X amount of thousand feet and decided to pull out, they had no documentary. <laughs> no, it, it's the, the, um, so Matt Dickinson, the, the who was just, I say just, I don't mean that rudely, but he was the cameraman when they said, well, Matt, why, why don't you go up and we'll make the documentary about you? And so he ended up on the top of Everest. And I, I, I think it might have been that year of the, what they refer to as the killer storm as well. I remember um, watching it and I remember him carrying on and doing it. And um yeah, no, I think it was Brian, Brian Blessed. Oh, Brian. <laughs> but, uh, mind you, he must have been about 105 years old. Yes. Do you think that... I, I know art is ever-changing by art, I mean, media. Um, but do you think that format will change? Because... I think when you're 18 years old and you watch a Bear Grylls programme, you're like, oh, my God, he's just done this and he's just done... When you get a bit older, you kind of... Especially if you... It's a bit like... I, I mean, I've written books for 12-odd years. And so when all the books about the Gulf War came out, you just know as an author going... Righto, OK. <laughs> yeah, no, no names mentioned, but you, you just... And I just wonder if that that kind of format of hyping everything, right, now I'm going to do this and now I'm going to... Whether that will... Maybe it will need to change because people will get fed up with the kind of... The, the, the disingenuousness of it, can I say that? 
Yeah, and you can, and I agree with it. You know what? When we did the Born Survivor shows, the Man vs. Wild, um, you know, it was pretty wild, as in there wasn't that much preparation, not that much planning in the early days anyway. And I didn't do too many of them. I only did a couple. Um, and, um, you know, it was all a bit sort of, wow, he's been the head of a snake and all this sort of stuff. And it was for entertainment and a few outrageous survival techniques, you know, which you could do like drinking your own urine, you know, you'd never do that, but actually, you know, you know, never ever drink your own urine, Bear's there drinking his own urine. If you then read Between a Rock and a Hard Place, when old um, Aaron Rollinson cut his own arm off, you know, he did drink his own urine during that. And so, that, you know, and it, if nothing else, it kept his morale going, just wetted his lips and no doubt it wasn't doing him very much good, but, you know, he survived and for whatever reason. So, yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, Bear, I know he's still like that to a degree. We've got lots of new programs. They're doing this You versus Wild, which is interactive. And that has really taken the world by storm, actually. You know, should Bear jump off a waterfall or shall we, um, you know, abseil down the waterfall? And they both brought their pros and cons. Hey, you decide. You press the red button. And uh, if you get so many decisions wrong, you can, you know, Bear gets rescued or in the last one, I think he's, he's, he gets eaten by a hippo or something, you know. And so there's all that sort of thing. But honestly, not just Bear, I actually think that we're all fed up. Or we've had enough of, I think to, to a degree, and don't get me wrong here, I don't want it to be so, but the military guys and the sort of maybe, the, and not pointed particularly at Ant Milton, but, you know, the big bearded military, Afghanistan, taking nothing away from those guys at all. But um, I know the TV industry is sort of searching for, you know, a bit more diversity in their adventures. And so they're looking at sort of different areas because, you know, the faster the viewers, everything's dangerous, it could kill you. I think um, people are really pressing towards experience and education and learning and all that sort of stuff. And quite happily see, you know, a female adventurer who hasn't been in the military and who isn't gun ho and sort of extrovert plodding along, um, having great adventures as well, you know, um, in a different format. You know, every time I talked to a TV company three years ago, it was all about escape and evasion, you know, sort of these adventures, which are like jump out of helicopters and all that sort of stuff. And I just think, uh, I don't know, I think it's time for change to move on and, uh, you know, change the formats completely. But the trouble is those old formats at the moment, Chris, they still put bums on seats. Yeah. TV companies are scared to take a risk. They're scared to get a new... Um, format and go, wow, this is so new. Let's get it on there. They'd rather just go, we know Middleton's going to put 2 million on Channel 4 seating, you know, or Foxy, I think, has got a new show coming out and he, to a degree as well, you know, put some bums on seats. And uh, and again, massive respect to those guys. Great what they do. And I love any bootneck or serviceman who, who can make a second career out of the media and go for it. But um, I don't know, maybe, you know, we do have to look at these formats uh, it's the it's the world of um, reality TV almost, isn't it? It's not quite reality TV, but, you know, it's sort of... You've got to remember, or well, we've got to remember that... I'm going to talk about young men now. I mean, I could talk about young women just equal with equal passion and, and, and defence, but young men look around them and they see a society of overweight fannies who were perfectly content to just do a job for 40, you know, work in a call centre, sit behind a computer, what, what, and I mean this, no, no disrespect, but what was used to be called woman's work. And they do that. They don't, they don't get out. They don't get the adventure. The furthest they get is they put the light on on a Saturday and they go out on their mountain bike or their, 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 their racer. Um, perhaps a bit of that, oh, I wanted to join the Marines, but the, these this kind of thing. And you can understand why young men look to people like Bear and, and the Ant Middletons and and they just must be open-eyed and, and sort of living vicariously through these stories because the average life for someone now just isn't really, it, it's, it's risk adverse, it's cotton walled. You can't even say the F word without 
getting a barrage of what whatever. Um, so, am I making sense? Does you know they must see they must look at these guys and think they're absolute legends. Whereas you and I know you can buy around the world ticket for a grand and a half. Probably maybe it's a bit bit more. You you can end up in Patagonia. You can be on. The, the this company is doing guided tours up Aconagua. Yeah. Um, you can get into the Amazon. You can fish for piranhas. You can stay overnight in 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 in, in shelters there. Um, I mean, I've backpacked every single through every single country in the Americas, from Alaska down to uh, Ushuaia there on the southern tip of Argentina. Just backpack with my cooker in my. You know, I used to cook for cheap so I could make my money last. I I did my um, first skydive on that round the world trip. I did that in New Zealand in Taupo. Um, subsequently went back to get my pilot license and skydiving license in Florida, all this sort of stuff. It It's not... It's accessible, isn't it? But I think, I don't know if the whole Xbox thing is something to do with, with, with giving people this false sense of adrenaline, but without actually giving them the goods, which cements in your mind the strategies, the techniques and the philosophies that make you understand that it's all available to get out there and smash it. I agree with what you said. And actually, you know, what you're doing, that's a proper adventure filled of, you know, potential danger on your own, or even if you were with someone else, you know. And I always used to think um, in the Marines, okay, in the Corps, you might be in Afghanistan, you might be in Iraq, and there's, there's different things, you know, there's bullets flying, there's people getting their limbs blown off. But my point is that actually you've got support mechanism as an adventure, whereas you've got accommodation and food and you're going to get paid. And uh, when I joined the police, it was the same. And then when I, in the TV world, guess what? I've got the old production company behind me, back to a hotel or at least a nice campsite, and it's all supported. What you do or what you've done is totally unsupported, you know, going across the world whatever you've done that's a real adventure with no backup and when you talk about xbox people like taking all the risks on the on the back of a computer there's never um you know nothing can go wrong okay they might lose the game and they start again and people do get i, I know a couple of grown-ups nearly my age who spend maybe five hours a day on the computer you know living the dream uh, but there's no consequences and uh, even to a degree what i do and have done there's no consequences what you do and you or what you've done when you have a proper adventure and you go backpacking or cycling or, or anywhere you know whether it's new zealand australia in the poles anywhere you know you've got that risk the real risk of running out of money um getting lost and these are the minor ones and then you know what the big ones are you know serious injury death you know either uh, coming across wildlife or coming across uh, or being attacked by someone you know they're real risks and real challenges so that that's that's the amazing thing there when we do the tv sometimes yeah we do do some big stunts we do take a few chances but do you know what when you see bear sort of abseil off something and he's um you know tied the rope around a stinger net or bush and you know, it's pretty much backed up with a couple of safety ropes here and there so it's, it's not too not too bad really but my big thing to everyone is go and have an adventure that's when i finish all my talks i just go go and have an adventure um and they don't have to you know do exactly what, you, what other people have done what you've done all they've got to do is head off to wales for the weekend you know take their bivy bag do a bit of wild camping you know break a few rules maybe and um have an adventure funny enough in everything i've done across 85 countries now i, I Oh, I've done 86. Did I say 85? <laughs> Sorry, I meant, I meant 86 and a half. Um, you've done me, you've done me. But I can, I, for people listening, it's a very simple set of rules. All of them I'll tell you now, I'm, I've broken them. But it's like, don't go on the beach at night. That is just a golden rule in any, can we say, impoverished country. You just attract trouble if you go on a beach at night. And this is 
we had a terrible incident when I was on HMS Invincible. One of our, our one of our wrens had to endure in Barbados. Um, don't buy drugs. That is another like fu funnel, whatever that word is. That 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 the the the, the, this, the, the risk just becomes ex ex exponential in that in that scenario. Watch the currents when you're swimming. That's another one that gets a lot of a lot of people. And there's a sm lot of small kind of tips like um, in the Americas, but what can happen is someone will come up to you and point at your backpack and you'll look and there's like mayonnaise on it or, or mustard, right? And you're like, huh? And then, of course, this guy goes, ah, let, let, let me help you. And they take your back and you think, oh, this, this, um, you know, can't think, of, can't think of the word, but this, this guy's come to help me. And of course they're not. They're just going through all your pockets at lightning speed um, in the marketplaces. You never have a, your passport in a pocket. Anything, it's all got to be down the pants or something because, you, you're just going to get, and it's clever the way they pickpocket. They'll have someone with a blanket over their arm. Um, someone will come up behind you. You feel them undo the button on your your you know your your cargo trousers or whatever, and and they're quick. They're out with the passport. They shove it under this blanket of the guy in front. He takes it like that and goes that way. So while you're shouting at this senorita or this senora she's got nothing she's there's, there's you know she's sort of in the clear um god i've made i've just made it sound like traveling is really really dangerous <laughs> yeah, don't I? Do it. it's super dangerous stay at home play xbox yeah <laughs> but the the danger of not doing it is way 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 you know many people go traveling it's absolutely fine just stay away from those areas that i said and you'll be and and, and it's yeah, the odds are well in your favour of uh, dying a happy life, let's say that, knowing you, you, you've you lived your dreams. And you've got to learn, haven't you? It's the adult learning cycle kicking in, so you can get caught out uh, when you're younger or if it's your first time travelling. But actually, when you've been on a couple of the little expeditions, I always say start slowly. You know, don't bite off too much. People have got no experience. They go, I know I'm going to walk around the world or I'm going to go across Patagonia or I'm going to do this. And I just think, just start, you know, a little bit, get your skills together. Uh, there's nothing wrong. I don't think we're doing a bit of training, do a bit of um, first aid training, do a bit of, uh, there's lots of companies that provide a little one day and two day courses to give this sort of advice that actually you've just been talking about, but go on a little venture on the Isle of Wight in, in the new forest and then maybe progress, do something in Europe and then actually, you know what, bang, let's go for it. Let's go for a biggie. You know, I think that's a, uh, and then you've learned, you start to learn. Um, as you go along and that's going to make it a little bit less painful I think rather than just throwing it all in I know it's a fantastic thing to do come on let's just walk across you know uh, Uruguay it'd be fine what could go wrong let's just take a, a backpack and a packet of matches yes. but um, you know when it does go wrong it can go horribly wrong I tell you what I love as well these new inreaches these inreach minis you can get now you know the have you heard of the inreach Chris this. I've heard of it you'll have to refresh my my aging memory about what it actually is well, it's just, it's just a tiny little box, uh, transmitter, GPS, emergency thing, American thing, Garmin, I think it is. And um, yeah, if you hit the red button, don't get me wrong, you're not going to get the special forces coming, but they know exactly where you are and they can organise a rescue. You pay a set fee for it, but you can put it on sleep. You can put it on sleep and pay like $7 a month. And then when it's activated, as in you're going away, it's like maybe $30. I don't know what the exact costs are, but you can text on it as well. The great thing is, it's satellite GPS anywhere. It's not, you're not waiting for a phone signal. This thing will work it, you know, everywhere on the globe. Um, so there's the inReach, and I think the new one's the mini inReach, which is a little one. I might be totally wrong, but um, great bit, kid. I've got the old inReach, which is great. Because one of the issues um, in the Americas is a lot of people go up, say they go up to see the crater of a volcano in the jungle. When they come down, all you've got to do is take the wrong path and very quickly you're totally disorientated. And people will walk for days thinking, oh, maybe it's this way. And yeah, yeah. Some some get rescued, fortunately, but but many, many haven't. Yeah, no. 
Mm-hmm. It's easy done, isn't it? Easy done. So, Scott, to finish off, what's what's next on your your uh, exciting planner? Well, I was thinking of uh, early retirement. Um, you look too old for that. <laughs> Shouldn't you have done that already? <laughs> um, do you know what? I, I do want to ease down a little bit. I've um, in the lockdown had the odd job luckily quite a big job which has kept me ticking over paying the mortgage but um i've managed to get out and do loads of paragliding and paramotoring which is my love now so every flyable day i'm out and you know people say you retire then you just die immediately because you've got nothing on i've got loads on you know i'll be back on the bike um uh, i love riding the bike my bike and um and uh, still in the gym and going on little mini expeditions and climbing uh, you know that's what i love to do so you know that's that's cool i just need a few more pennies for maybe just a little bit longer so the tv world is just starting to pick up again um it's, it's sort of picked up already at christmas in the uk because most of the stuff that i'm attached to is worldwide so it's just starting to open up and um, i've got i've got a job starting next week in uh, say Mammoth Mountains for a couple of weeks. And then I've got three or four more um, good TV shows to recce and scout before Christmas, which will tick me over nicely. But after Christmas, I'd like to, to you know, do more mountaineering and just uh, ease down a little bit if I can afford to do so. I mean, when when is it, Chris, the right time to um, you know, enough is enough? You know, when have you made enough money? I'm not a millionaire uh, by any stretch, but, um, you know, you just keep going. I'll oh, just do another job. Well, that's quite a big job. I'll just keep going. And for me, it's not about the money. It's about weeks away from home. And actually, for the first time this year, it's been quite nice being home a bit more after spending a long time away from home. I mean, it, you know, the last eight or 10 years, I've probably done at least 200 days a year out of the country. Wow. Um, and, you know, that is probably for a good eight years of those 10. Mm. So, uh, You've got kids. It's, oh, he's, he's like, um, he's a man now. He's like 23, 24 soon. Okay, so that's not too much of a sacrifice in that area then. Yeah, no, he's all right. He's, he's, doing, he's doing his own thing, but um, yeah, that's okay. Have you ever thought of Everest? Is that anything you... you... Do you know, I think every mountaineer, um, you know, does it on any capacity, but particularly professional mountaineer, mountain it would think of Everest at some point and we all poo poo it we go oh well you know it's too commercial um just pay you fifty thousand dollars and off you go um and it's not really a mountain climb as such more of a yomp and all this lot but the truth is in the back of your mind you, you always think to yourself it'd be quite nice yeah uh, to go on Everest and summit it because you know just the way it is it, although I often say to people in talks there's a million other mountains which are, which are great to climb you know, and I've done a few biggies myself, you know, and been to Nepal three or four times now. But uh, actually, it's always in the back of the mind. I've, what I've always hoped for is that it might be a TV job and they need some safety on it. And then I can do it uh, for free, you know, and get paid to do it. Because taking sort of three months out of your life and uh, 50 grand, whether or not you get it, uh, you know, it's for charity or you manage to get some funding. You know, it's quite a big old blip. Um, but yeah. Maybe it will still be there. I'd, I'd certainly take it on if it if it was a, a TV job for sure. Mm. What about yourself? Would you go up? Yeah, I've got a few issues there actually that have come to light. First of all, I've just realised I've got low blood pressure, or I I, I don't know. A, 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 a sports doctor might tell me no, Chris. It's because you're athletic, but my I'm like one twenty over sixty seven at the moment, which technically puts you in that box i don't know if you've got any i i don't really know what that is scott because i'm not like i'm you know it's not something i've ever really had to consider before but where it affected me is i did a triathlon on sunday and the pre-swim i just went just chucked myself in the sea the day before just to see the temperature and bloody hell i had what 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 looked what you would describe as Raynard syndrome is I could see where the blood had drained from my toes and my fingers, leaving almost a yellow waxy like skin as if it's just about to go frostbite, that kind of that yeah, yeah. weird feeling. And that it's, it's concerns like that, that I'd have to get, I'd have to get sorted out before I could consider putting my body into that, that, that sort of temperature 
I mean, that is that is low blood pressure, but of course you are fit as well. Um, and that will have a, a bearing on it, but that is quite low. Um, mm. And circulation, I don't know, go and, go and suss it out and see what the score is with it. But um, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing you're super fit. Yeah, well, I'm, yeah, I've never considered myself as a fit person, but for my age, I, I, I suppose I should say that I am. Um, but yeah, it's presented quite a challenge, really, with respect to getting to the bottom of it, because I'm not, obviously not big on going to doctors, and I'm certainly not big on taking pharmaceuticals. Um, but I am big on diet and breathing, and I'm looking at this cold water immersion that seems yeah. to be really really popular i have a cold shower every day anyway so I mean, bear's big on that bear every for about two or three years bear will take an ice bath or, or a lake, lake swim um every, i mean all the time he loves it and he swears by it you know mm, definitely yes i'm also starting a charity so um one of the things in the back of my mind might might be to somehow amalgamate a trip to everest uh, or trip up everest into it um so maybe our paths will will cross in the future scott oh yeah no bring me in i'd love it yeah and i'd love to go back to nepal again um again it is quite it depends where you go of course but that you know the valleys which either you go um everest and you head up to cumbra icefall that way or you go annapurna so that's what people mostly do but actually there's so many other places to go in Tibet and um, and Nepal worth investigating. So I'd love to go back maybe next year and try and do something uh, because you know people always think higher is harder. And yes, you've got the altitude issues, but actually, you know, you know, you can get some amazing, invigorating, challenging climbs much lower down. You know, which are good fun. So yeah, wasn't like, it Annapurna? There was, I read a great book recently. I'm sure, it was Annapurna. Uh, one of the first. 8,000 metre peaks to be to be climbed in in the Himalayas. Yeah, when you look at a name like Herzog. Yes, that's the gentleman, yes. And they almost all bloody killed themselves, didn't they? Yeah, yeah. I mean, things haven't changed much now. But, um, yeah, that's a great book. Yes, it was, yeah. Definitely, definitely. A lot of versions, because I think a few of the different people have written about that. And Herzog was the main guy. He was the guy who wrote the book but he had a couple of french mountain guys they all fought, fell out as well they all hate each other yeah but, you know, who knows what went on the mountain i should say for our friends at home my charity idea isn't just i started charity so i can climb everest no <laughs> my charity is uh is I, I don't know what i want to sort of encourage people that are struggling a bit with life and give them my sort of what's helped me over the years and break down a few barriers and phobias and maybe tweak a few paradigms just to open up the future for people. And I've been thinking about doing it through adventure sport. And so things, things like rowing the ocean perhaps, or climbing a mountain, this, this kind of stuff. I'll just chuck, chuck that in there before I'm. Uh... Yeah, great. It's all super worthwhile. And I would like to do a bit more for charities as well, because, you know, it's such a good way to live your life and do adventures, you know, it's not all about chasing the dollar. I'm, I'm sort of done doing that, really. Um, everything I want to do now has to be, that it really sounds cheesy, but for fun or the greater good, you know, that's how I feel now with it. Because um, you can just chase the dollar and chase the dollar, you know, and uh, yeah, when's enough? Yes, definitely. Scott, stay on the line while I, while I click off record and I can thank you properly. But for the purposes of this interview, you've heard this a few times before. I'm now turning off the tape. No, um, massive thank you, Royal. Absolute. Um, I, I, as you can tell, I love all this sort of stuff. I, um, it's just a, for me, it's a fascinating area of life. It combines travel with the media, with adventure, um, and a bit of art sort of thrown or production work thrown in. So thank you for coming and enlightening us as to what goes on behind the scenes of a Bear Grylls production. Uh, well, no, I've really enjoyed it, Chris. Thanks for asking me. And uh, there's a few more bits you can drag out of me on another occasion. Yes, let's do, let's do that. Perhaps we even do a live 
Q and A together. They they they're always quite popular. Yeah, no, sure, I'd love to. Definitely. For our friends at home, much love to you all. Look after yourselves. If you could like and subscribe, that will really help. And we'll see you next time.